Okay, I am live coming to you, as you can clearly see, from Sao Paulo in Brazil. And I am very excited, guys, to talk to you today and to dive into giving you a bunch of travel hacking tips. Because as of 24 hours ago, I am completely nomadic again. And uh, I sold everything I owned in the world and brought it with me. I actually got my suitcase lost in transit, but that's a story for another time. Um, I am super excited to be traveling. I am so happy to be back in Brazil. And of course, I'm doing it without breaking the bank. And that is the theme of today's uh, presentation. I'm going to give you guys a bunch of tips because I know the uh, thought process is generally that you need to be super rich to be able to travel the world. And that's not been the case for me before. That's not the case for me now. I suffered a lot of financial struggles. If you guys saw an update I did a couple of years ago, um, I saw a lot of those uh, struggles in America. So as I move forward, I'm going to continue with a budget travel themed mindset. So I don't actually have this view. I'm in a very humble little uh, apartment, but I'm still in Sao Paulo. And uh, yeah, so... Uh, say hello in the chat. Let me know where you guys are all um, watching this from. And I really hope you find this interesting. I'm going to be talking about a bunch of different things. And then at the very end, I will take all your questions. And um, I also have Alice, who you will see uh, types in as fluent in three months in our chat. And um, yeah, so at the very end, I'll take all your general questions if I see something related to what I'm uh, talking about, uh, like in the current slide, I'll address that as it pops up. And yeah, that's about it. So I, I wanted to share some fun stuff with you guys. Let's dive right on in. So this is the presentation that I am giving, how to travel the world without breaking the bank. I wanted to move myself to one side so I uh, wasn't blocking the text, but that's probably a little confusing for some of you, so I'm going to change the settings there. And would this work if I was uh, coming in from the top like this? Um, let's do this temporarily, just just to confuse people as they're still arriving. Um, but yeah, I can see we got Chris in not so sunny Manchester, um, and I know about yourself, Lorenzo, and Jonathan in Philly, and Mona from Warsaw. Uh, so yeah, Lorenzo from Brussels, uh, Kimberly in Salzburg. So, oh, we got a good mixture of people. All right. You're probably getting dizzy seeing me upside down like this. So let's, uh, flip myself back to this, this, that looks good. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that'll do nicely. Put myself down here and shrink myself just a wee bit while I'm giving the initial intro here to you guys. Um, uh, Rashida is of course coming in from Raleigh. You can see I got your name right this time. Uh, Charlie is in Sunderland. Jim is in LA. Um, and Sarah, my good friend Sarah, is in Orlando. So, or from Orlando, but not sure where you could be, your fellow traveler. Uh, so yeah, got a good crowd of people. Keep saying hello while I dive in. In case you don't know who I am, look, this I can mimic this photo of me. Ah, whatever. That's that's my like bio pick I use in a bunch bunch of things. So you already know me. Flute in three months guy. I have been traveling the world for 20 years. I did have a break of a few years in America where I was settled, but that break is over and I'm back to traveling again. Um so of course the theme of my travels has been language learning. I'm not gonna be talking about language learning today. If you guys have questions on language learning, Make sure you follow the Fluent in Three Months account that you would see in the chat uh, because that's where I do all of my language learning webinars. This channel, I'm going to keep about the travel lifestyle and other things like that, like mental health recovery, since a few people have asked about that. So, um, uh, yeah, you know who I am. Got uh, Kate from Montreal and Rebecca from uh, Missouri and uh, Ohio is where Patricia's come. Got a great crowd of people. So here's, here's the theme of what we're going to be talking about today. So my experience in traveling for 20 years, just a quick summary of that. The best hacks for finding cheap travel and accommodation prices. Um, 
while uh, working while traveling, well, that's a huge advantage and a bunch of suggestions for how you can find jobs that you could take with you when you travel. And a little summary of the many, many, many jobs that I have had over the years before I ever got into flute in three months. I've had quite a lot of jobs and that'll give you some inspiration for how you'd be able to do it yourself. And then at the, at the end, I have just a, a two minute message from a sponsor of this video. So they are going to have a very straightforward way that you can simplify a lot of the stuff I'm talking about today, but I'll just talk about them for two minutes before I go into the Q and A. So uh, yeah, that is uh, the theme of what I'll be talking about today. And uh, thanks for saying hello, everybody. Angel in from Orlando. Got a good group of people. So let's dive into a quick summary. I'm not gonna not gonna tell you guys my life story. You're not here for my life story. You want the travel hacks. But very briefly, um, I was on the road for a total. I will be. On, I will have completed 20 years by early next year. So I've been on the road for over 19 years now, and I have lived in many, many places. I think I have spent at least three months. You guys know three months is the magic number for me. I spent at least three months in over 40 countries. I know people who visited a lot more countries than me, but they tend to go a lot quicker. Whereas I've spent uh, three months in some and even two years in countries like Spain. So um, I travel a little bit slower and I've had a lot of interesting and fun adventures because of that. I mean, travel is just one of the most mind-opening things you can imagine. The adventures and the breadth of experiences you have. So I'm so glad the world is opening up again to allow us to potentially get back into travels again, as I'm currently doing. And I, I waited it out the pandemic, but now I, I can tell you guys from experience, having taken this trip, I mean, they lost my bag uh, when I was traveling here. But that could have happened before the pandemic. So other than that, my travels are going smoothly so far. Um, and then, of course, I travel so much that National Geographic recognized me in 2013 as their official traveler of the year. They printed it in their magazine. They gave me this title. It was uh, a great honor. And that shows you that uh, I do have some experience with travel. Uh, shortly after that, that's when I moved to America. I had a very boring... Uh, like whatever, seven or eight years in America. But for, like I said, I'm back at it now. Uh, so now time for the hacks. That's that's it. Yeah, I was. I told you guys I wasn't going to give you my life story. That's that's what we're talking here. So let's go into the actual hacks. And if you have any other questions about my travel experience, feel free to add them into the um, into the chat, and I will try to get to them at the end. Um, so the very first thing we're going to try and do is reduce the cost. I'll talk about working online shortly, but let's start by the most important thing, because you don't need to be earning millions in a job if travel is affordable. And so many people, when they think of travel, they imagine it's something you have to save up for for years and maybe have like $50,000 in the bank before you'll ever consider traveling. I do not have $50,000 in the bank myself personally maybe you do if you do good for you and uh send some my way won't you but i don't have a lot of money in the bank and yet i'd be able, able to make all of these uh um flight like i just took a flight yesterday that got in yesterday uh to uh sao paulo from i left portland oregon went through toronto and got here i flew business class so that means that my seat could actually recline all the way so that I could sleep flat. And uh, you might hear some noise because I'm in a very noisy area here in Sao Paulo. I could sleep flat. I had lounge access while I was waiting for the transfer. And I didn't, I didn't pay any money. When you think of business class, you imagine that's something that costs thousands. But I, I got it for free. So I'll be uh, addressing that a little bit um, when I get into all of this. Uh, but the, the first thing, let's, let's start with the basics. Use flight comparison websites. I, a lot of beginners, they tend to go to um, these like uh, travel companies that do the work for them, but they have so many overheads and so many other fees that they add in 
And I think nowadays we don't need to do that. It's not as necessary as it used to be because you can find the cheapest flights with the very simple tools. Like my favorite by far is Google Flights. There's also Skyscanner. There's a bunch of other ones like Kayak and whatever. But the, these are the two that I've personally found the most useful for flights because they're aggregators. So rather than you going to the one airline, like British Airlines, and saying, will British Airlines fly me here? No? Okay, I guess I'll check the next. No. You search where you're starting, where you're ending, maybe give a couple of other criteria, like uh, how many transfers you're willing to go through and uh, what your budget is, um, um, whether you can fly economy and, uh, and your date range that you can fly. Put all of that in and they will tell you the cheapest flight. So that's the first thing you do. And if you're flexible, because that, that's the thing is some people, they try to fly a particular day and that day is not flexible. So for me to get to Brazil, I got this for, for, uh, for free, but I couldn't just decide which day I wanted to go. I had other dates in mind, but I looked at it and this day happened to be the one that was the most affordable for me to use the points that I'll be talking about in a second. So I flew to Brazil on this day because the airline decided that was the cheapest day. Simple as that. So I will always try to have some wiggle room and arrive based on when the uh, cheapest days are. So uh, another thing is that if you can pack light, uh, the luggage can be an extra charge. Um, I am fortunate that I have status with the airlines or I buy a business class flight. So my check luggage is actually free. But for the most part, if you're, if you're paying in cash, then um, try to see if you can get your, the amount of things down. You'd be surprised what you can take on the plane with you. I have a, a big backpack for all my technology and you can bring another like a handbag. And that could potentially be all that you need if you're going on a relatively short trip. So, um, uh, yeah, hello to everybody. We got uh, and Crucia, great to see you again. Um, and ciao, Ermi, great, good to see you from um, uh, my friends from, from Instagram and elsewhere. So, um, uh, yeah, thanks for saying hello. But yeah, pack light and you would be surprised. Like, we always overpack what we need. Uh, you can buy things. So, as an example, right here in Sao Paulo, the airline lost my bag. So that means they lost my clothes, they lost my toiletries. But you know what? I, I'm in a major city. Sao Paulo has a lot of stuff. So I'm going to go out and buy some replacement clothes. I already bought replacement to toiletries. They weren't expensive. So um, uh, you could theoretically lighten your load by, by making sure you don't have to bring everything with you. Because whatever you think you may absolutely need, you can almost always buy it at the destination. Like some things are more expensive, like electronics and laptops and phones. Those things are more expensive to buy in a lot of other countries, but you can buy everything else. So don't think you have to bring your entire house with you. Um, and then, of course, one thing I did for many years was I actually bought a special jacket that made me look like the Unabomber because it was uh, this jacket with a lot of pockets and I would put my language learning books inside those pockets and that would be, uh, that would count as being on my person. Uh, so I would have maybe 15, 20 kilograms, which is uh, like about 40 pounds. I would all have that like on top of me so that I wouldn't have to check any luggage. I was extremely uncomfortable. It's not something I would recommend, but uh, I would recommend it if you want to really save the budget and uh, get more stuff on the plane. Another thing that a lot of people do is you are allowed to bring a pillow on board if you want, because they expect that you might want to have a little nap, especially for, for long flights. So a lot of people will just take a pillow case and rather than putting an actual pillow that's a kind of useless thing to travel with, put all your clothes in there and, and other things. And then you can carry the pillow separate when you're walking on the flight. So all these extra little things can be um, ways to, to bring more with you that ultimately, because uh, you don't want to max out, bring your entire house with you, but you can save money by not having to check any luggage. That's kind of why, why I bring it up. And then, of course, you don't have to fly. You can get a, a coach or a bus between places. If you're thinking about trains, check out this website, six, six, uh, seat 
61.com. Uh, there's loads of other local popular transport options uh, that locals will recommend, and I'll get to that in a second. All right. So that's with flights. If you have any questions about that aspect of flying, I'll get to the points of the business class stuff in a second. But uh, anything else related to flying, let me know, and I'll get to that question later. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is accommodation. So to find cheap accommodation, bunch of options here. Couchsurfing used to be my favorite. Unfortunately, the website has declined over the years, but it still exists and there are still people who use it. So it may still be worth signing up to. Another one is Be Welcome. That's very, very handy. I, I've found a lot of people using trusted house sitters. So if you don't mind watering somebody's plants, feeding their dog, and making sure their house is being taken care of in other ways. Some people will let you stay in their house for free. Now you do have to build up with this website to have several references. Uh, so people obviously trust you. So it's a bit more work upfront like that. Um, but after that, I've met a bunch of people who travel for free with accommodation simply because they're looking after other people's houses. So to look into that, Couchers is an alternative to couch surfing, which is growing. So couch surfing, be welcome, couchers, the three of those together give you this uh, chance to stay in someone's house for free. But um, it, that's really budget. Like you literally will sleep on their couch or their spare bedroom. They have a mattress on the floor, something very simple. Don't have high expectations, but of course you're more likely to stay with a local and have some fun. I personally have hosted over 2,000 couch surfers. I did that through the main website, couchsurfing.com, when it was popular. I wouldn't be able to do that on the same website now, but I've hosted all those people. Why did I host them? Because I wanted to practice their languages. So I wouldn't have to travel. I was in one place. They would come to me, and the rule was, hey, if you let me practice French with you, then stay here for a few days, and I'll show you around. I'll give you a tour of the town in French. And that is something I did for several years to get practice in my languages. This was before uh, Skype teachers were uh, much more readily available. I had to be a bit more imaginative than language learners nowadays have to, have to be. But it's still possible. So something to keep in mind. Um, you can also do more direct language exchanges. If you're young, you can do an au pair experience. These are great at staying with a family. You usually have to speak uh, English or your mother tongue to the child of the family, but the rest of your interactions can indeed be um, all over the place. Uh, look at this, Carl, my brother-in-law's in in, uh, in the chat. Good to see you, Carl. You probably know a bunch of these tips as well. So yeah, language exchanges or pairs, these are a great way to uh, essentially avoid paying for accommodation um, and to get cheaper accommodation. Don't stay in the city center. Uh, or even in the city, you can stay. Whoops, you can stay slightly outside the city and just deal with maybe getting like a one-hour transport in. And as an example, I just uh, literally a week and a half ago was at Glacier National Park in the very north of America in Montana. And when I looked for accommodation right by the park, they were astronomical. It was you're talking like two or three hundred dollars a night for everything close to the park. What I did instead was I stayed a 40 minute drive. So four zero, it's a, it's a pretty annoying drive, but you know what? I was surrounded by mountains and nature and I was in no hurry. So by putting that 40 minutes in, my accommodation price went down to $50 a day. So that can show you, you don't have to stay right in the middle of the action. If you spread your range, then you can do a lot more. And I even got my actual brother, Cormac, in, is in the chat as well. Ah, the whole family is joining me for this. Everyone say hello to my brother and brother-in-law who just, just said hello in the chat. Uh, so yeah, stay in a particular neighborhood. Make sure you embrace using public transportation. This one is definitely tricky for Americans because in uh, having lived in America, I can tell you the American mindset is that only poor people use public transportation. And uh, that's not the case in the rest of the world. Everywhere else in the world, it is absolutely normal for everyone to use public transport. It's in many cases, it's usually clean. It's very safe. Um, no problems with it at all. So definitely uh, think about using public transport 
to get to where you need to go rather than staying right next to it. And the, all of these things completely transform the price of where you might stay. So now let me talk for a couple of minutes about the points in the miles situation. So this is how I got the uh, flight that I just took um, for free. Essentially, and this is easier if you're in America, but there are options for this in other countries. What you want to do is you want to look for a credit card offer that gives you points for signing up. So in America, some of the better ones, uh, like American Express, for instance, they give 100,000 points just for signing up and using the card for a couple of months. A lot of other ones give similar, like 50 to 100,000 points options. So in America, it's very easy to see these. There are equivalents in, I know, in the UK and Canada. Uh, it's a little trickier in some other countries, but look into which credit cards give you these kinds of systems. So that's the first thing, is just by signing up to the card, you will get potentially 100,000 points. I'll tell you what those points mean in a second. The other way that you'll get points is by simply using the credit card. So, of course, if you're not paying off that credit card, and you'd have to be some idiot to not do that. Wait a minute. I did that. I got myself into immense credit card debt while I was in America. That's another story for another time. But right now I can tell you that at least when you are consistently paying down your credit cards, then you're not actually going to accrue any interest uh, on those cards. You just have a, an annual fee that uh, isn't too bad uh, when you sign up. So presuming that, you, if you put all of your expenses on your credit cards, then every dollar that you spend, or maybe every pound or every euro, is equivalent to one point. So as an example here, you can see I just punched into um, a random flight from New York uh, to Thailand here, Bangkok, and I put a date there, and you can see it comes up as 40,000 uh, points here, or miles. Like Whether they say miles or points, it's usually the same thing. So what that would mean is ultimately either with the sign-up bonus, so 100,000 points, if you get that, it means you could take two or three international flights for free. Um, and otherwise, you would have to spend $40,000 standard on your credit card. If you're spending that anyway over a year, then that you get a, fr a free flight out of that. Now, another good thing about the credit cards is sometimes they'll give you extra points for other things. Like that might give you five times as many points in restaurants. So every time I'm in a restaurant, I will make sure I'm paying up my credit card. In fact, if I'm meeting with a group of friends, something I always do is I'm not going to treat them. Unfortunately, I'm not re rich, so I can't just say, hey, everyone, dinner's on me. What I can do is say, hey, could you guys give me the cash and I'll put this on my credit card? And that way, the, and I do this many times and they either give me cash or they'll use an app like Venmo. And I know there's a bunch of apps in, that, uh, in other countries where you can just transfer money directly. Um, so I would have people transfer me that money and then I'll just pay the entire meal with my credit card. And that way it's still only costing me the price that I personally paid, but my credit card sees this much bigger number, which is then multiplied by five. And if you do this over time, you start to accumulate a lot more points. And that means that getting to a number like 40,000 over the, the span of uh, like a half a year or a year is a lot more realistic. And then another thing you can do is if you have a company or a private business, you put all your expenses on the business's card. So Fluent in Three Months is a pretty big company. We've got like 11 or 12 people working at Fluent in Three Months. And it's got a lot of expenses. Like the website gets like about a million visitors a month. So I have to pay Amazon web servers a lot of money uh, to host the website so that it works. So I pay that money with my credit card. And that means that all of the money that, that my company has to spend anyway, every single dollar is a point. And that means I build up all of these points. So that means with all of this spending that I'm doing anyway, as long as I'm paying the credit cards down, so I'm not dealing with interest, uh, all that spending gives me all these points, and then I can go into a system like this and pay for it. And this is just a screenshot uh, really quickly of economy, but the, the flight I just took from uh, Portland to Sao Paulo, 
that was 60, 60, thousand miles. So that is 60,000 miles to go across the planet and do it in business class. So that's just a, an overview, um, as it were, with uh, the travel hacking with points and miles that you do it through credit cards. And another thing is the credit card sign-up bonuses include other things like you might have status with an airline. You might have status with hotels that can give you free upgrades for some of your rooms, status with car rental companies. So because of my American Express card, I had status with Avis, uh, the car rental company, and they gave me an upgrade on the car that I just drove 10,000 kilometers through America on. So all of these extra benefits are something you see a lot of travel hackers do, and that's using points and miles. So if you have any questions on that, drop them in the chat and I'll try to get to them at the end. But moving on, another thing I do is um, it, like I use an ATM card to make sure I get all my money. You do not want to be exchanging cash. You're going to get a terrible rate on cash with extra fees on top of it. So when you're in the local country, if you need to use cash, take it out with an ATM card. And then alternatively, a credit card, which you're going to, like I just said, you're going to earn all those points on. Credit cards give one of the best exchange rates without adding extra fees on top of them. So I will only use my credit card when I'm abroad or money that I've gotten from an ATM card. And if you happen to be in America, then this card that I'm holding in the picture is, um, is from Charles Schwab. So look up the Charles Schwab bank account. And if you get that, then this card has an extra feature where it will refund you every ATM fee in the world. So that's a very handy thing to do because now I don't even need to think about it. I can go to literally any ATM that I see. So when I got out of the airport, first ATM I saw, I went up to it and I took out my Brazilian hay ice and I didn't pay any extra uh, fee. Well, technically I paid the extra fees, but then this bank will refund those fees into my account at the end of the month. So that's all. I've only seen that in America, this Charles Schwab bank account. Uh, when I travel with my Irish ATM card, I would typically have to look up ahead of time which banks tend to give uh, lower fees and then just take out more cash in one go. Um, but yeah, just wanted to mention that real quick. And a few other things. So make sure that you avoid buying food and drinks in touristy areas. Prices are always going to be higher on that. Uh, go where the locals eat. So um, you guys know meeting up with locals is a big theme of my travels. And as well as just getting to know them, I'm also asking them for advice on where I should go, what I should do, and where they tend to eat, because they're going to eat in the cheaper places that I'm not going to find as easily if I just look it up on Yelp or look up a guide to the city, where locals eat tends to be a lot more affordable. And of course, you can get the ingredients and cook at home, because a big part of traveling is that eating out expense, and you can avoid that by cooking uh, by yourself. Um, like I said before, paying the local currency, credit cards are very handy because they will instantly um, convert it to the best amount. And one other thing is if you are abroad and you see it mentions, do you want this in your local currency, uh, in the original currency of your card or in the local currency, always say in the local currency because the credit card machine, uh, it gives its own conversion rate. So it may be simpler for me, for instance, I have an American credit card. I may see, oh, look, I can pay in US dollars. Why don't I just click that? Because the card machine is making extra money by giving me that option. I will always click the local currency and then back in my bank, they'll do the conversion. It's going to happen anyway. So always keep that in mind. You don't want to be mixing. Um, you don't want to select your currency when you're paying with a credit card machine. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned the ATMs are the other way to do um, to get cash if you are going to use cash and avoiding the, the, the worst fees. Just never, ever, ever use those exchange, uh, exchange cashier areas that you see in the bank. They're always worse. All right. Um, and then, of course, practicing your target language with locals. These are just always going to give you cheaper ways. So... 
Um, you save money on tutoring lessons by just like, a, you know, if you think about it, if you were to get language lessons, uh, presumably not if you're getting it via Skype or Zoom, because those do tend to be te cheaper. But if you imagine the price of going to a language school and then multiply that over time, it actually ends up cheaper just going to the bloody country and just learning the language there and practicing it there. So going to the country can be more affordable than uh, the typically more expensive options we tend to see. Um, and I see, uh, just based on what I was just saying there, Jonathan had a question. Is it smart or stupid to use the ATM to get local currency in the airport? I always wonder if the exchange rate at the airport is different than at other sites. Yeah, unfortunately, Jonathan, if you don't have the card that I mentioned, the Charles Schwab, the, uh, so firstly, the first ATM that you see at the airport is always going to be a high fee ATM. They pay extra money to be visible to tourists as quickly as possible so that they can make more money from those tourists. So you don't want to use one of those generic things. You might want to just do a very quick Google ahead of time and see which banks give good exchange rates and low fees for foreign currency. Look that up ahead of time, make a note of it, and then go to that bank. Maybe that bank is in the airport, uh, or that bank's ATM. If so, great. But um, uh, And maybe they have like a website where they list where their ATMs are and they mention if it's in the airport. But I would know ahead of time, if you don't have this uh, card I mentioned, I would know ahead of time which banks do you want to go to and that's going to save you money in the long term. And they may be in the airport, but the first ATM that you see in the airport is typically a bad idea because they're going to give you a bunch of fees, which um, unless you have a special card, you're not going to, you're just going to lose those fees. Okay. Um, what else was I saying here? So all these other tips, like uh, instead of using Airbnbs and hotels, the language gives me an extra edge. So here in Brazil, I booked some Airbnbs for the first couple of weeks, but after that, most of my research will be on the ground and I'll be looking for pousadas, which are like essentially cheap accommodation that you're not going to find if you do a Google search as easily. And you find that through the locals. And I'm going to save so much money by doing it that way. Uh, and of course, making the friends that you might be able to meet again and stay with. So um, uh, in my, I've been to Brazil a bunch of times. So another way I'm going to be saving money is my friends have just said, hey, Benny, you can stay in my spare bedroom. I'm not using it and you're welcome here. You're a friend. So that's another thing is making these connections instantly saves you that extra money. And then, of course, they may cook at home for me, which uh, is also, you know, I'm going to eat amazing food, but I don't have to go out and pay money. I mean, I'll try to make it up to them. One thing I try to do uh, before I leave is I try to get a bunch of little souvenirs that aren't going to be too heavy or take up too much space, but are still special, like things from uh, from Ireland. And I take them with me to give to people as uh, mementos or presents. And that kind of balances out sometimes if they're treating me to meals. Um, I'll never let them pay for me to eat out in the restaurant, but uh, if they are like cooking for me in their house or something. Um, so yeah, get loads of advice from locals and you'll see all these things you can do. All right, so that was the first half of this talk I wanted to give to you guys. Um, the second half, uh, so the first half being spending less money is one way you can afford to travel for many years. The second way is, of course, making the money. So let's talk about that a little bit now. So when if you work while you're traveling, that's going to offer you a lot more financial security because you could save a bit of money and take that with you. But of course, you might need that money for like, you might run out of that money because of an, ur uh, an urgent situation. It could get stolen from you. There's all these other things that might impact your financial security. So by having consistent work while you travel, uh, you are consistently getting money. So it's going to save you in that. You have more freedom to go on adventures for a longer time because whenever we save up money before a trip and then take that trip, that trip is very limited. It can only be this amount of time because you have to return to your home country to work there. Whereas if you're working on the road, you can stay extended periods. It's why like, I'm working on the road and it's why I can spend three months now in Brazil. I don't know if I could possibly spend three months in a country by saving up money ahead of time before going there. I've done that maybe 
once or twice for trips of a month or so. But generally, I've had to take my work with me. It's the only way uh, long-term travel becomes affordable. Um, so you could do that with local jobs. So working online is the is uh, is completely transformed the world. But you can still get uh, like in-person work, which have the advantage of giving you more contact with the local language and the local culture, culture making friends with your coworkers and such. Uh, but of course, with remote jobs, you have location independence. So you don't have to go to the one place. You take that job with you wherever you may go. And uh, it's extremely convenient. So it's it's uh, like all the trends now. But I've, I've been a location independent worker since 2006. So um, I've been doing this quite a while, long, long before pandemics made it a lot uh, more regular for people. So you'll have a much more full experience if you can work in the country. So here's a bunch of options. The one that you may be surprised with is actually inventing your own job. Because a lot of people think of the standard jobs, maybe the job they learned in university. But there are ways you can create uh, a means of income by combining skills that you may have. So you might search locally, you might search online to find jobs and see what's already advertised as available. Um, but to give you an idea, here's a bunch of positions that I've held. I've had a lot of jobs over the years. So uh, these are all the jobs I've had while traveling. So uh, most recently, of course, I have been a blogger. Technically, that's what I call my job. I mean, I do all sorts of things, but ultimately it's all surrounding the Fluent in Three Months website. So that is essentially what I am. I'm a blogger. I'll talk about that a little bit in a second, uh, how you'd make money and, and such from it. I'm also a professional speaker. So the blogger is location independent. I can do that anywhere. The professional speaker, I have to speak on stage. I mean, you can get get paid to speak via Zoom, but usually they pay, they pay you a lot better if you go to the event that you have to talk at. Um, I'm also a published author. So by writing books, you don't have to be anywhere in particular. So this is the thing with uh, with writing. It's uh, it, it's not as essentially it's not a great means of income. So my writing work, even though my books are successful, there's no way it could replace the uh, other ways that I earn an income. But it is supplemental to it. So um, if you've always wanted to be a writer, this is potentially one thing that you could do and take the job on the road. Uh, this was one of my first ever location independent jobs, professional translator. So, Ermi, you said you like the idea of inventing your own job. I didn't ex invent the job of translation, but I did come up with this thought. Well, hold on. I have a degree in electronic engineering. So that is its own unique thing. But unfortunately, engineers or engineering is a very competitive landscape. It's very hard to get a job. Uh, when you're competing against so many other people who've just graduated. So being an engineer can be a little tricky. Then I've learned a bunch of languages, and I had learned them over these years, some of them to professional levels because I'd gotten the European Common Framework uh, certifications. And then I thought, okay, I got these language skills and I'm an engineer. How can I take these two completely unrelated things and put them together? And when I did that, I found something special. It turned out that because engineering is a technical field, there aren't a lot of native English speaking engineers who also speak other languages. It's just not, I mean, in the English speaking world, it's pretty rare, unfortunately, to speak another language. It's even more rare if you have a technical background, like you're an engineer. So I use this to my advantage and I translated engineering documents from multiple languages to English and I could charge good money for that because I was in demand. There were very few people who could offer the unique thing that I could offer. And for many years, uh, between 2006 and uh, 2010, before I started earning from Fluent in Three Months, I traveled the world as a professional translator. They would email me the documents, I would translate them, and I would email the result back to them and I could travel with that work, earning in euro, spending in the local currency. So uh, I'm not saying you necessarily have to be a translator. Uh, I mean, uh, Simon or uh, Simon says you're an engineer too. 
um, and you're currently working in digital marketing, so maybe think about combining the two, you know? So this is what I mean by inventing your own job. Uh, like technically my Fluent in Three Months website was me inventing my own job. But even before then, a little bit of brainstorming of the, uh, the skills that you might have and combining them together. And Jonathan, you're an engineer too. How do you find uh, translation jobs? So here's what I did to merge my engineering towards professional translator. The first thing I did was I found a translation company in Italy that I could work for, for very cheap. I had to accept that for six months, I was going to earn terrible money. So I wasn't doing it for the money up front. What I was doing was the experience and the training. And so I accepted a bad wage, but I learned a lot about translation. They trained me and they got good value out of me. But then after that, I had the skills where I could then go on and work for outsourcers. So the outsourcers I found were on pros.com. I'll put this in the chat so you guys know. It's P-R-O-Z.com. Uh, so pros.com uh, is still active. I don't know if it's currently the best website, but when I was doing it 10 or so years ago, it was the website to find, um, actually more than 10 years ago, it was the website to find people who had translation jobs for you. So pros.com is just for translators. And then there's other resources like uh, Upwork is a place where people find all sorts of jobs, upwork.com, and they offer translation jobs. There's a bunch of other companies that you might want to find for like the outsource translation. They find the clients. That's ultimately what I settled on was an outsourcer who did all of the work of finding people who needed things translating. And then the outsourcer would send it to me. They would take a commission and I wouldn't have to worry about anything. They just emailed me the work. So that is uh, essentially what I did. I hope that makes sense. Um, but yeah. Uh, other things I've done is Skype-based consultant, uh, Zoom-based consultant as well, where uh, people have asked me for advice, not just on learning a language, but how I grew a business. Uh, so this is just one of the many things. But then, of course, during these are all the things I've been able to take with me. But while I was working on location, before I worked as a translator, I've had a bunch of other jobs, other means of getting an income. So one of them was I was a youth hostel receptionist. Look at that beautiful flowing blonde hair uh, that I had. <laughs> very, very bad bleach job there. But uh, this was the hostel I worked at and the people I worked with, where essentially I took the fact that I spoke multiple languages and I used that to get myself into the tourist industry because there's a lot of opportunities for multilinguals in the tourist industry. So... This is at a youth hostel right on the border of the Vatican City. So I got to not only live right at the Vatican City, but from my window, I could see the Sistine Chapel and I wasn't paying anything for it. Now, give, granted, what they were paying me was pretty terrible. It was not a good wage, but I had the free accommodation and I was living right in the center of the action in Rome. And it was such a fun experience. So uh, that is one of the jobs I've had. I've, of course, been an English teacher. English teaching is so easy for natives to get into, to uh, go to any country in the world. There's a demand all the time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, this is me with a bunch of my students in Salamanca in Spain. Um, I was also a mathematics teacher for Johns Hopkins University. So uh, this was my first job ever abroad. Uh, and of course, since I got the, the degree in it, I was also an electronic engineer. This is the um, internship, the stage that I had in Paris. And I just took my degree and I went with it uh, for a very low paying job. That was a great experience that I was able to uh, live in Paris. But that's not all. I've had a bunch of other random jobs. A FTSE 100 investor, not with my money, but with someone else's money. I used software that they uh, knew they couldn't learn. So I learned that software that would advise them where to invest the money. That was my first ever job when I was 12 years old, simply because I knew how to use computers and pretty much no one else in my hometown knew how to use them. 
Um, I was a t- I was the tech support at a computer shop in uh, my hometown. Um, I was a race car controller. All of these were from using my knowledge of computers, which of course nowadays is common. But at the time, that was my special talent. And rather than like just working with computers, I worked with all sorts of interesting jobs. So you'd be surprised where you can take your skills. I've even been a first aid assistant um, as a side job while I was teaching uh, the mathematics. They added this if I got a first aid certificate that this would be a separate part of my job. So I was uh, brought on field trips specifically just to help in case there was a first aid emergency. So bunch of ideas for you there based on my personal experience. And all of those are jobs I've had um, like uh, over the years. So uh, now let's talk a little bit about um, the traveling careers that you can get into. So what I mentioned before about merging careers, you take your own to make your own job if you're good at languages, how is the language factor missing in your own industry? Maybe there are ways that you can um, make your current job involve languages and make yourself stand out. Um, but being multilingual by itself is not enough. What other value can you bring? And this may be value that's worth paying for. So, of course, language teacher. This is a remote job. You uh, the, That picture I showed you before... That was me in location, but nowadays it's so easy to find work as a language teacher online. If you use either italki or Preply, both of them are good to work, find work as a teacher. And I've, I've talked to a bunch of people who travel the world because of teaching on these websites, whether it's teaching their mother tongue or if it's teaching another language that they have learned to a very high level, this is where they do it. They teach on these sites, they get paid from it, and they travel with the money that they earn from it. Uh, if you're a, if you're looking to teach English, something else that I did uh, before I started traveling was I did a weekend TEFL certificate teaching English as a foreign language. I went to this website, i2i.com, and there was a hotel in my hometown in Ireland, in Cavan, and I went to that hotel and they trained us uh, over the Saturday and the Sunday, and then uh, I had a certificate. And that certificate helped me get my first job teaching English. And from there, I was able to work for bigger schools. I personally worked for Berlitz and the Wall Street Institute. And I got those because I started with smaller schools by getting this very simple certificate. So um, English, being able to teach English is a huge means for so many people to be able to travel the world. And then, of course, you can create your own online entrepreneurship um, if you if this is something you may feel you're skilled at, especially if you're good at making content. This is the direction that I went. I grew my audience with free stuff. So you see free things like this webinar, like my website, which has thousands of articles that are completely free. And then uh, you can create things that expand on what you talk about for free that people can potentially buy from you and that can support you. When I first started in the blog, I wrote an ebook, and the ebook had my language learning advice uh, concentrated into it that was harder to see just by browsing my, my website. That's how I started earning money from fluentinthreemonths.com. Uh, you can do this nowadays with membership sites, a video series, you can interview people. So these are a few things. If you have a particular thing that might be interesting for people to uh, read more about or watch videos uh, with you about, then uh, you can um, create online content that people may potentially buy. And the way you get eyeballs on that content is by doing a lot of stuff for free, whether that's making loads of free TikTok videos or just writing blog articles, whatever it may be, it depends on what your skills and background is. As long as you're adding value to other people's lives, then they may well come back to you. Another thing is affiliate marketing, where if somebody else has created the product, then you can focus on uh, having all of the free stuff and very simply sending people to that product. And then you will get a referral fee. Um, if you send somebody and they buy, then you get a percentage of what that cost was. So if you write reviews for products or you're a huge fan. Uh, so as an example, just last week, I was talking to my friend, Sean, and he uh, he was using this uh this thing in his bed that I also used called 
a chili pad and the chili pad cools your bed down, uh, which if you tend to sleep hot, you absolutely love it. The chili pad was like $500, but he then added it to his website. His website is about golf. So like where to go to play golf in the world. But he still decided, you know what? I'm going to tell people I liked this thing for my bed. And now he makes like $1,500 per month just from talking about chili pad. So from people looking around, finding reviews of it, clicking it, he earns money from that. So uh, this is uh, like just from sharing something he's passionate about and using a special link that he will earn from. This is one way that online entrepreneurs can make an income. Of course, you only do it with products you trust. If you're just kind of spamming people and saying everything is amazing, you should check this out. People aren't going to trust you. Um, on Fluent in Three Months, we only ever talk about affiliates for stuff that we genuinely use for language learning. So there's a lot of crappy language learning products that give that pay you well if you refer people, but we never use those because people would just lose their trust in us. They wouldn't want to read anything we say anymore. Um, but of course, if you are feeling up for it, you can create your own per, uh, premium product. It is a lot of work though. And then of course, you can be a speaker or a coach. Uh, you might find an agent. If you ever want to publish a book, find an agent to do that with. Uh, you might be then, when you publish a book, able to speak at conferences and give seminars and give sp Skype-based consultations. So these are the kind of things you can't quite start these jobs immediately. But if you build a presence, then you can uh, switch into those. And here's a, a few other ideas for you. Just like all of these industries, tourism has so many opportunities for people, especially if you speak a bunch of languages. Healthcare is another good one that sometimes people need translators. Even if you don't have a background in interpretation, they would appreciate if you're good at, um, if you have a background in medicine, that you can help uh, people who speak another language. Uh, diplomacy, technology is like, because like we were saying, and people like confirmed in the chat that there's not, that there's like this overlap sometimes that uh, the technical background may not have a lot of, lot of language learners. And you stand out a lot if that's you. you work for the government in law. And then of course in uh, religion, there are jobs that people will pay for as well that require language learning. You can uh, run your own business. You can work as a teacher in academia, even uh, like food, restaurants and such, finances, scientific community, hotels, service industry. All of those are just quick ideas for you, depending on what your background is. So having said all of that, uh, Alice, would you share the link in the chat now? Uh, so I want to talk about the sponsor for just two minutes. And then I am going to go through all of your questions. So share your questions in the chat and I will very gladly catch up and try to answer everything that's on your mind. Um, and then of course, if you stick around till the end, I'll ask you to fill out a quick survey. And if you do that, you'll get a $20 coupon for anything that we sell on the Fluent in Three Months website. So uh, just keep that in mind. But yeah, um, for global work and travel, I highly recommend you guys check this out. Uh, so you can see the link in the chat and I'll give the link on screen in a minute. But essentially everything I've talked about is a lot, a lot to think about. I haven't even covered things like getting a work visa and um, a lot of all the other logistics of moving abroad. So rather than try to go through everything I just said of figuring out how to get the cheapest way of traveling and how to um, find accommodation and how to find work as well. Rather than do that all yourself, because it is a lot of work. This is a company that of course I recommend, and I have an affiliate link for them because we've checked them out and they're the kind of company that has a style that I would trust. So I find other companies that I don't think I would recommend. They don't give you a very authentic local experience. Whereas, uh, this, uh, company global. Uh, they will um, help you find the exact type of work that you want, whether that's an internship or volunteer work or some other kind of work. Um, they can send you to a bunch of destinations, every continent, so you're open to the whole world. And within all of that, they set you up, they cover all of these problems 
that essentially I've sent, spent the entire webinar trying to explain. Um, so they find you a suitable position to work at. Uh, the whole travel process is covered. They'll even help you with your work visa, which is very complicated in a lot of places and not something I could even hope to give a webinar about. So having somebody local helping you do that solves a lot of headaches. Uh, they'll give you a lot of tips and insights about the trip and the destination. So you don't have to do the research ahead of time and you know I'm going here. So when I'm there, I'm, I, I know what sites I want to see. I know what places the locals tend to go to because I have this company supporting me, helping with that. Then they make sure your trip is safe, especially if you're worried about that as a solo female traveler and so many other issues that you might have. They support you in that. They're available 24 seven. So um, uh, yeah, this is a company I really uh, do recommend. So um, they are giving a 100 off. So that's 100 in your local currency. That can be dollars, pounds, or euro. If you go to this URL that you also see clickable in the chat and uh, use the coupon code Benny. So highly recommend you check them out because they solve all the problems I've been talking about, all the logistics of travel, of finding work, of settling into the place. Uh, it is a lot for someone to do. It's been something I've worked over 20 years on and I have barely scratched the surface in this webinar of all the things I've had to learn, all the mistakes I had to make for many years. So check these guys out. They'll solve the whole thing for you and they will just get you the work abroad and uh, set you all up with all of that. So go there, use the discount code, and I highly recommend you check them out. Okay. All right. So that being said, I'm going to check out your questions, see what you guys had. And uh, I hope you found this interesting. I really wanted to share as many travel hacking hip, uh, tips as I could. Let me make myself a bit bigger again. There I am. I'm very happy with the lighting situation I got here because uh, this is my portable uh, system. Uh, just before I answer your questions and do share them in the chat, there is a survey um, that you can see. So Alice is going to share a link to the survey. Click that link. And then if you spend just one minute answering those questions, we'll give you a $20 coupon on anything that we're selling on Fluent in three months. Okay. What questions do you have for me? So a few questions that were a bit earlier in the chat. Um, vague Anne, uh, what about traveling on your own? Uh, what do you recommend for women? So this is why I suggested the company I just did because they, they make sure you have a safe experience. I know as a, as a solo female traveler, you have a lot more things that you may potentially need to worry about. I would research other female traveler uh, blogs and other female traveler videos. There's a lot of them on YouTube. Uh, it's a lot more common than you might think. You'll get a lot of good inspiration from them, what they do to stay safe. Obviously, I don't have that perspective. I can, I can only speak from my perspective and how I've stayed safe, which isn't really the same issues that you would have to deal with as a solo, solo female traveler. So I would do some research and seeing like, how do you travel as a solo female? And uh, you'll find a lot of resources on that. But of course, if you use a tool like the global work and travel that you see us link to, um, they, they make sure to solve a lot of those issues so that you they find you safe uh, work as, um, uh, as, as somebody in the country. All right. Um, Johnny asks, if you were to build an app, how would you structure it to help learners? If I was to build an app, let me just get this text away from my background, put myself back in Sao Paulo here. There we go. This is where I actually am. So it's a lot more exciting to have this background here. Um, if I was to build an app, oh, that's a great question. If, but if I had a really good app idea, <laughs> I probably wouldn't be sharing it with you in this webinar. I'd probably be secretly working behind the scenes making it. And I'd love to say that's what's actually happening, but I got too many things I'm doing, so I'm not working on an app. Um, it's a great question, Johnny, but I, I don't really know. Um, nothing's coming to my mind about a particular app that I would want to create that doesn't already exist or that I can't imagine. 
So kind of a broad question. I'm sorry I can't uh, answer it directly. Um, all right, Erica was asking about the sponsor. Um, what about the legality of working in another... Or, okay, not necessarily about the sponsor. What about the legality of working in another country on a tourist visa, even in a job, uh, job like a tutor? So, yeah, this is a very tricky situation because um, technically... It depends on how the country views it. And unfortunately, this is changing. More and more countries are starting to create visas that are they're calling um, like either location independent visas or foreign, not, not foreign workers. I forget the terminology, but there's a new visa system where they expect you to be an expat who is not taking a local job that you are working from a foreign employer. So this did not exist for most of my travels. So that meant that, unfortunately, I would just arrive as a tourist. I would be working online back in my home country. And it's a kind of a gray area because a work visa means that you are essentially taking work in that country. You're taking a job that a local may have. You're earning in the local country. You're paying taxes in the, the local country. And uh, that's kind of why you need that visa. But it's only nowadays that, that we're really catching up that you can have a foreign-based job and be visiting a country. So right now, I'm traveling Brazil, and I'm not taking a digital nomad visa. Thank you, Joseph and Charlie. I, I was slipping my mind the exact term they used. So a digital nomad visa is uh, starting to come out for a lot of places. This is especially uh, more useful if you're staying for a while. Generally, if I'm only staying for a few weeks or just a, a couple of months, I wouldn't worry about it too much because from the country's perspective, I'm bringing money in and I'm spending that money in the country. I'm not taking any money from the country. But if I'm staying longer, then you need to have some kind of official presence. Another advantage I have is that I have an EU passport, so I can go uh, to the likes of Spain or whatever, and I can apply for a residency, but I can still be working with my foreign-based job. So it's a great question, but it's a kind of a, a very gray area. But if you're traveling briefly, it's not something I worry too much about. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. All right, keep that in mind. But it's not something I stress myself too much about it for relatively brief trips. Okay, uh, let's see what else. Uh, so, Encrucia was saying, I'm an old lady. I have some health problems, but I do love to travel. So if you have any tips for me, I would love to hear. Thanks on the tip of the world travel. Okay, glad to glad to hear that. I uh, Let's see. So, for if you have health problems, you just want to make sure that ahead of time you know the country is going to cater to those those issues. Like if you um, if you can't take any stairs, you want to see ahead of time, is the country wheelchair accessible? And sometimes they help you with a little bit of that. Like uh, a lot of metro maps will have a little wheelchair symbol. And I've used those even not for health issues. When I know I've got a really big suitcase that's heavy that I'm traveling with, I will ahead of time look at those metro maps specifically to find the wheelchair access. Because what that means is I know I can... Um, I can wheel my suitcase to an elevator and I can take that up rather than dragging it up a bunch of stairs. So, um, uh, of course, I can't personally speak to this uh, since I I don't have health issues myself, so I don't know how good my advice with this. I, I can only share useful advice from my own experience. But good for you on doing that. I would say that, again, consider the, um, um, the, the global work company that we've been sharing um, and again, let me bring their link back up on screen for you here. Yeah, consider consider these guys uh, because they will solve a lot of problems and they may actually cater to particular health issues. So just something to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, uh, what else have we got? Uh, Angel was saying, any good remote work sites uh, for older remote workers? Angel, I, I wouldn't, I mean, as long as you don't have any health issues, I wouldn't necessarily say your age has to factor into it. Um, unless the job is very physically demanding. 
nowadays there's a lot of things that you can do like teaching a language for instance as long as you have the skills i can't imagine they would turn you away because of your age so i wouldn't even start worrying about it un unless it's some kind of industry that has a bias towards younger people uh, but i have definitely met people who have traveled older and who find work older i'm about to turn 40 myself and I plan to be traveling into my 50s. And uh, like I have found like, the kind of work that I can do while I take on the road with me. But uh, that list of jobs that I gave, I can't really imagine any of them being a greater challenge if I was 60 or more, uh, presuming I was in decent health and still had my full mental capabilities. Uh, translation would be just as easy for me. Um, teaching English would be just as easy for me. A lot of the work I've had would be so. Um, yeah, that's that's what I would say, Angel. Don't think of your age as an issue. Um, age is just a number. When I turn forty, I don't feel I'm not necessarily that much older. It's literally just a random number of laps that I happen to have uh, of completed of the solar system. You know, it's not. It doesn't have any impact on limitations I should have in my life if it's just some number. So I'm hoping I'll maintain that attitude as I get older um, because as you guys can see, I'm starting my nomadic life again. And maybe people would say that's only for people in their 20s. I, I beg to differ. So I, I don't think age, sh age should ever be an issue. Um, any other questions, guys? Keep them coming. Keep them coming. I'm happy to answer all of your questions. And again, please make sure to check this out and use the coupon code Benny. This will solve a lot of the logistical problems, uh, just having someone else deal with them for you. Okay. Uh, so Casey, uh, for online remote work or stock market, how is the internet access and speed? That's a great question. This one I can't answer because this is a problem I face all the time. So um, I look for a local SIM card. In Brazil, when I, like, when I just got here, the first thing I did was try to get my local SIM card, put it into my card, and now I have three gigabits uh, of, of roaming data per week that I can use just on my phone, and I can tether my computer to that. So I could potentially work just from my phone, and I have done that when I was doing my translation work back in the day when I had to use 2G can you guys imagine how slow 2G is? Um, I think I actually even worked with Edge 1G uh, at one stage, and that took a long time. But I connected to that internet and uploaded the Word doc, which fortunately isn't that big of a file. But I worked through my phone. So if I can work on, on 2G, you can certainly work on 4G and 5G that's available now. Um, so you can do that on your phone. There's also a bunch of things that you can bring portable data hotspots. Um, so you don't necessarily need to worry about if a place has internet. But generally, to make it absolutely simple, I just make sure the place that I look for has a good uh, has good internet access. So this place that you guys are watching me stream from in Sao Paulo, Brazil, clearly it has decent internet. So I don't have to look for internet cafes or whatever when I'm out and about some yeah a combination of making sure your accommodation has good internet and just that you might be able to be portable especially if you don't mind working from cafes uh, is something that you can do um jonathan do you have any tips on travel health insurance yep use world nomads world nomads that's the one i use i very simply go to their website and i tell them the dates i'm going to be in a country so i told them the dates i'm here in brazil and i think they might actually cover me for my lost luggage that I was telling you guys my bag is being uh, has gone. So I think I'm going to look into that today, but I think they may actually refund me on clothing and other replacements that I have to buy because this shirt is the only shirt that I have right now. And it's already a little stinky. It's a good thing you guys can't smell because I traveled with this shirt. I haven't changed it because I don't have any other clothes. It's all lost in my suitcase. But um, World Nomads may potentially refund me the money that I'm going to spend on clothes because it's not my fault the, the bag was lost. But of course, they also do health insurance. 
So if I get into an accident and I am in the hospital, then they are going to uh, cover the, the fees for me. So yeah, that is uh, who I recommend um, if you want to check them out. Okay, Sarah, hello from the US. I'm a recent engineering graduate, me mechanical and aerospace, and interested in traveling abroad, particularly Ireland. Do you recommend a working holiday versus a regular visa? Working holiday visa. Um, does Ireland have a working holiday visa? I'm not sure. So I don't know the situation for Americans going to Ireland, but I do know when I went to America uh, first, like before I got green cards and everything, um, I did a, re a bit of research and I found there were temporary working uh, visas and those were a lot easier to get. If you get a regular work permit, then because they potentially expect you to maybe be moving to the country, you have to jump through a lot of hoops. Like to, for when I moved to America, ultimately, um, it was a very complicated process. But when I got my temporary work permit that was only good for the summer, that was super easy. I just sent in an application and they approved me immediately. So I would definitely prioritize a working holiday visa, a temporary work visa, because of the logistics, it's going to be way easier because uh, the other visa, they have to worry about if you're maybe moving to the country and then they have to add a bunch of other things to you. So, um, uh, yeah, hopefully that has helped you there. I really appreciate you guys watching this and thanks for joining me on today's live stream. Um, I'm going to answer one or two questions uh, before I wrap this up. Um, but, yeah, I haven't posted on this channel in a long time. And I really wanted to kick things off. I'm hoping, uh, depending on how I figure out my lost luggage situation and some equipment I need, I may be finally uh, doing a bunch of videos on this channel. A, a lot of other advice, like a lot of people were asking me how I sold all my stuff because I had a house filled with, it, with things in Austin, Texas, and I sold it all. So I'm definitely going to be um, looking into that. Let me just uh, scroll through all your comments, make sure I didn't uh, miss anything since I started. I hope you guys have been finding it interesting. Um, yeah, some of you were just agreeing with what I said, um, which is great. And then I saw my family popped in. Uh, Patricia, Patricia uses ride shares to practice languages. I like that idea. Um, While I'm scrolling, put your final questions in so I see them at the very end. Uh, Mr. M4RIQ. Hola, Benny. Sou do Brasil. Sei que você me entende. Já estive aqui. Ah, você do Brasil. Eu vou treinar o meu, o meu português. E agora eu tenho conta em português uh, no Instagram e no TikTok. Brasilandês. Uh, procure e vai, vai me achar. All right. Uh, obviously, getting a lot of practice with my Portuguese lately. Okay. What about the... Yeah, I think I've gotten up on all of these questions. All right. Uh, Simone asked, what about international and intercontinental insurance for health? Um, yeah, I'm ki kind of... So, inter... Yeah, yeah, I've, I've covered that question. World Nomads is basically the answer on that, on that one. Um, yeah, they're much cheaper than Global Alliance. The great thing is, Jonathan, it actually uses Alliance, believe it or not. It piggybacks off Alliance, but for whatever reason, it's way cheaper because uh, it cuts out a lot of stuff that you might not need. So, yeah. Um, all right, last question. What do you do with your language learning materials when you sold your house? So I had to make a hard decision because I want to travel life. So I had to uh, decide I'm not going to travel with my language learning books. I am going to switch to entirely digital. Language learning books are so useful, but unfortunately they're too heavy and bulky. Uh, I still can't get all the ones I want on Kindle, but I can get other language learning resources. So I sold most of them and I kept a small number and I put them in a friend's house and he's put them in his attic for me, so I'll grab them off him. And that's literally the only thing I have that isn't with me right this second are a few books in my friend's attic. 
So, um, yeah, I did. I didn't actually keep anything. I think I have two little books for Portuguese uh, since I'm here anyway. And when I re when I revise them, I'm just going to put them aside and leave them. I'm not going to travel with them. So yeah, hopefully that answers that question. So thank you everyone for joining me. Make sure you are subscribed to this channel and you've clicked the notification bell because I will be posting not just live streams, but well edited videos where I'm giving you a lot more tips about how I've transitioned back into this nomadic life. And of course, don't forget to follow me on social media. I'm Irish Polyglot on Instagram and TikTok. And um, I just posted a reel and a TikTok this morning about my lost suitcase. I promise it's a funny video. Um, and I'm getting a lot more active all over the place. I've taken multiple years for mental health recovery after some difficult times. And now I'm ready to go out into the world and see what it throws my way. Lost suitcase, whatever, man. I've dealt with worse. I can go on. So yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate all of you for joining me. You're welcome, Mona, Jonathan, Sarah, um, uh, and then Anne Ma. I can't say this name. Anne Maban, Maban, Maban. Maybe I said that right. Uh, you're asking me how I sold them. That is an upcoming video. So I've already been writing out the script. How I sold everything I own on Facebook Marketplace and other websites. How, like I, I made a good amount of money that I can start these travels with. And that's from selling all my stuff. So that's coming on this YouTube channel. Definitely hit, not, not hit, what is it they say? Uh, punch, uh, that whack that subscribe button. I, I forget the terminology modern YouTubers use. But um, pow, punch, uh, shaboom, that subscribe button and the notification bell. And you'll see those videos. So, um, muito obrigado. Thank you so much, everybody. Really hope you enjoyed this. And again, don't forget to check out these guys. These uh, They sponsored the video. This is the reason I've been able to, to do this today. Um, and they're a very good product. They will solve a lot of the problems I just talked about. So, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. And you'll be seeing me all over the social media and all my updates from Brazil. So until the next time, I will wish you all... A very happy...